Today, uh, in our Refashion Podcast episode, we have a guest, Chanel, or Little Pink Maker. Uh, Hello, Chanel. Hi. So nice to have you uh, here with us today. It's uh, it's super nice to to be here. It's um, definitely a topic that's close to my heart for many, many reasons, but um, we'll, we'll dive more into that as we get in. Awesome. And uh, together with Nell, we will discuss about the common myths about upcycling and um, we will try to debunk them. And also what we will do, we will talk about alternative materials and how can we uh, contribute to environment instead of being uh, a little bit less bad. So without um, further ado, uh, Nell, Tell us a bit more about yourself. What is Little Punk Maker? What do you do? And um, yeah, just introduce yourself. <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out like, what do I actually do these days? Um, so yeah, my name is Chanel Vestigal. Most people know me as uh, Nell. Uh, I am the CEO, boss woman, whatever people want to call me. I don't know. I just roll with it. Um, of Little Pink Maker. So Little Pink Maker is a creative studio space here in Copenhagen where on learning a skill, um, learning about alternative materials, mixing science, art, technology, engineering and mathematics together in this one holistic, harmonious bundle, you could call it. And uh, we work with various different people from outside of our community too. So we work with institutions, universities, policy makers, change makers. And um, yeah, we just try and get people aware that there's so much more you can do with life if you think outside the box. So uh, yeah, it's basically what I, I do and I do a lot of things. Totally. And one of the things that you work on is um, material innovation, right? Yeah. So one of the things I am, one of my main focuses at the moment is um, alternative materials from natural resources. So the thing that most people don't realize is that every single textile we have, so for example, that t-shirt in your wardrobe or the pair of jeans that are on your legs, everything's made from cellulose and cellulose is a fiber. Now, if you think of this, that means then every single thing that is a fiber could be made into a textile, which is true. So plants, plants are made of cellulose. So cellulose can be broken down and made into, you know, things like cotton, hemp, flax, linseed. They're all natural materials that you can make things with. But then if we start thinking a bit more broad spectrum, we have things like pine trees. It's seen Christmas, you know, what if your Christmas tree could become a dress that you could then wear, you know, throughout the festive season. And at the end of the festive season, you can compost and then you don't have it in your wardrobe. There's so many things that we can do with plants. But again, we have to think outside the box and think that everything we have can have a second or third life cycle if we educate ourselves, basically. So uh, that's what I'm working with right now. I did a project called Material X, where I taught people how to make biomaterials in their home using everyday objects like eggshells and coffee grounds and seaweed powders that they can buy in the Chinese supermarket. And the idea was to educate people in their homes during COVID lockdown of how to be more sustainable with the material choices. And of course, I make all my stuff here in my um, studio in Copenhagen. That sounds very innovative. And I don't think I have heard of any other projects like you. So I am truly happy to have you uh, here today. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I I'm definitely a wild card when it comes to the stuff that I do. Because again, the things that I do, it's not rocket science. Um, it is scientific in its, in its matter. And you, know, you, do, you need to understand certain metric values and how to operate certain machinery and chemical equations. But anyone can do that if you again want to learn so what I do isn't hard it's just uh sometimes complicated and smelly at best but anyone can do it I like how you bring this uh, closer to each uh, and every one of us it seems that um, if I looked into my uh, kitchen cabinet maybe I would also find some materials I could create something with so uh, talking about the materials that you already touched upon uh, the plant-based materials uh, could you tell us a bit more and how feasible is it to have them in the textiles and how would that change the landscape? It's it's really feasible. Um, so, for example, plants in general, if we talk about what is already on the market. So we have companies who make 
um, pineapple fibers. We have companies who make um, textiles from eucalyptus. We have companies that make um, soya bean textile based materials. There are companies already out there working with this kind of technology, but the problem is that it's hidden behind this kind of lock and door system. So unless you know what you're doing, everything stays behind the lock door and nothing really gets out to the general public until you know, it's picked up by uh, a magazine or a newspaper or some kind of big news outlet. And then it goes out to the commercial you know, public. And then the public goes, oh my God, this is amazing. I really want this. And then they look at the price and they go, oh, this isn't for me. It's not affordable, it's not attainable. Whereas the stuff that I do teaching people how to extract fibers from nettles. I mean, every single garden here in Copenhagen these days seems to have some kind of bramble bush or a nettle kind of problem. And nettles actually, they date back all the way to the prehistoric ages and uh, early as the 1800s, we were actually spinning nettles and we were using nettles to make jackets and they're amazing piece of architecture, the weaving and the construction and the skill that's gone into making this garment still stood the test of time and now it stands there for you to see too. So it is really viable to have these materials long lasting, but the problem is it's not affordable for the everyday person on minimum wage working within, you know, again, a retail industry or hospitality industry job, which is what most people tend to have, especially if they are consuming fast fashion. You know, people have a low wage, so therefore they go and buy a low wage based product. They don't have the money to go out and pay 100, 200, 300 pounds for, you know, a pair of shoes that are made of pineapples. They just don't. So the idea behind what I do is to teach people so they can basically start to look into how can I do this myself? How can I see how scalable this is? And then, OK, how can I make the things myself? How can I weave? How can I loom? How can I drop spin, you know, traditional Viking methods for making thread? How can I look at history and how can history influence my future? That's beautiful approach to that. And I think um, this hands-on experience is an uh, eye-opener for a lot of people um, just because they can touch the materials, they can play around with them and rediscover the old arts. Oh, yeah, so one of the things, um, so when you can actually touch and feel the materials, I mean, for example, I have the leftovers from soy milk and this can be used as padding inside of jackets. So instead of having things like animal feathers, um, goose down and so on, you can actually use the leftover fibers from your soya milk and you can actually then basically make jackets and padding and pillows and you know, things that require stuffing, you can actually use this for, but then you can spin it and you can make it into thread and then you can actually sew with this. Um, so the tangibility side of things is really important, but in, at the same time too, a lot of people don't understand that this is doable. Mm -hmm. And what are the characteristics of alternative textile materials? There's, there's many characteristics and it depends upon what kind of properties you get from the fabric. Um, so every cellulose has a certain thing. So there's hemicellulose, there's lignic cellulose, depending on how it's been grew, depending on how it's been harvested and processed, it can be waterproof, it can be fire retardant. I mean, I have some mushroom leather, that is twice as strong as steel, it's fire retardant and waterproof. Um, I have plastic that's made from eggshells that is super strong, it just looks like concrete, it's, it's crazy. I have um, a biomaterial made out of seaweed that you, know, you can wrap a sandwich in and eat at the same time. You know, imagine having that, imagine having a sandwich, you could eat the wrapping and there was no plastic left at all. That's crazy. There's so many characteristics that depends crazy. upon the, yeah, it's crazy. I know it's crazy, but it's doable. <laughs> but also it depends upon the properties of what you want from said material and what your main goal is for the material. If the material is to be made into a pair of pants, you want it to be long lasting and durable. You want it to be flexible and breathable at the same time. If it's a pair of shoes, you want it to be waterproof. You want it to be really withstanding, you know, to being worn down to friction and movement. So again, it comes down to a lot of rigorous testing and figuring out maybe this isn't the right thing for me. Maybe this isn't the right material to make my product. And adding into it this, this concept, you know, am I designing for the disaster? Am I designing something that is here and now I can work here and now, I care about, you know, what's coming? Or am I designing this for the next 60, 70 years because I really care about my products and I really want my product to last? It's something to really question when you're making a material and in general, trying to figure out 
what kind of material to buy. Even, you know, from say, you know, an online retailer, if you're buying a garment and it says it's made of linen, is it really suitable, you know, for the next 50 years, ideally? So what you should do is ask yourself the question of where do you see this material going, but also at the same time, asking yourself, how far down the line do you want this material to last? That's really the ultimate question. Okay, I see. I always had the thought of alternative fabrics being maybe not as durable. So for example, when I think about the um, fab fabric made out of orange peels or pineapple peels or uh, milk uh, byproduct, I often imagine that this product is likely to biodegrade faster by usage. So I, in contrast, wouldn't see this garment lasting for next 50, 70 years. And that also comes down to, again, for example, if you've made a parachute out of oranges, for example, is that orange really suitable to be on the floor all the time, rubbing with the friction? I can tell you now, no. <laughs> and I know this because I make my own orange peel-based fabric. It's a no, because oranges contain moisture and oranges like to absorb moisture. Now, the outside of the orange is great because again, it has this um, amino acid, but the actual orange itself, it likes moisture. So it'll absorb moisture and eventually it'll start to be weird and funky and turn into this kind of strange gloop, I'm gonna say. Um, but it's not suitable for shoes. Now, if it's a belt, okay, is it suitable to be a belt? you have to ask the question of how much moisture is it going to come into contact with? Is it going to be in contact with a wash machine? How often do you wash the garments? Most people I know also put their shoes into the wash machine. It's, it's a bit strange. I've never really quite understood why things do that. Um, you know, I, I take these soles out my shoes, not the whole shoe, but yeah, anyhow. Um, but in that sense, you, know, you have to ask the question of what your product is made for, is it fit for purpose? Is it fit for the life cycle that you vision your product being? I mean, if it's a t-shirt made out of pineapples, okay, how many times can I wash this t-shirt before it starts to look a bit tatty? How many times can I, you know, iron this t-shirt? How many times can I put this t-shirt on with something else? Is it gonna rub friction? Because that's the problem as well. Most garments that we have in the market, you'll start to wear them after a while and you get these tiny little bobbly bits. That also comes down to how it's been made in the production process. So again, how well has it been made? Has it been loomed? Has it been commercially loomed? Has it been made by hand? If it's been made by hand, then of course it's not gonna be as durable as something that's been made commercially. So you have to really ask the question of how was my textile made? Who made my textile? And am I really gonna get what I want from this before I put my money where my mouth is? And that ultimately is a huge thing that the textile industry should be playing a part of, but isn't because again, they just want people to come and buy their stuff and they don't really wanna have this dialogue about where things come from, how they were made, you know, is it really sustainable? Because there's so many companies out there that claim, you know, they have sustainability lines, and, you know, conscious collections. But what really is conscious? You know, is it your subconscious or is it your physical conscious or is it your moral conscious? Or, you know, is it a financial conscious? This doesn't really say anything. Your conscious can mean so many things, but it doesn't tell you if your T-shirt's going to last for the next six, seven, eight months, whatever. It doesn't. So we should be having this dialogue, but it's not happening. And I don't think it ever will happen. Sorry to say. Mm. So um, then my question would be, do we need to produce the garments, especially textile garments, in a way that they would last long? Uh, on one hand, we have a very, very spoiled consumer right now who wants to consume everything very fast, including fashion. On the other hand, we try to advocate that the garments should last longer and we should wear mm -hmm. them more. So what would be your position in, in that regards? And my position in that is is an interesting one because you know we're told that we should have a wardrobe with the same five things and you know the same five t-shirts and it's like yeah i understand that and i get why because you know it becomes like a personal uniform so to speak but at the same time those five t-shirts and five pants are going to wear up really fast if they haven't been made in an effective and I'm, i wouldn't say better manner but it is kind of in a better way because the system we have now for producing garments is broken 
It really is. Whether it be people still using child labor, which in some countries they still do, they don't pay people fair and equal wage, whether it be children or adults, or, you know, if it's just being doing through singular one by one on a seam, you know, seamstress table, that in itself as well can also be really bad. I know so many seamstresses who are horrific at sewing, but they're doing it just because they want to claim a sustainability money. They want that green cash because they think that by sewing two pieces of bed sheet together, you know, and calling it a jacket and putting it on a the market, they're going to make seven, 800 crowns. No, because it's going to fall apart after two, three washes. The thing with all of this is that we need to be more mindful about our material choices. If things are to last, then we should really ask ourselves, is a pair of pants made out of silk really ideal for everyday wear? No. <laughs> it's like mum beans, you know, it's like the masks. Everyone's talking about these masks right now. And you have to ask yourself this, is wearing a fabric mask every day a sustainable alternative? No, it's actually not because what we have right now is a buildup of masks going in machines. And now masks are made of different material. They're made of multi-materials, for example. So you'll have a layer that is might be a cotton or a silk, and then you'll have an inner layer and another layer. So we should be three layers, ideally. But the problem is, what happens is those layers, when they're in the wash machine, they'll friction against each other, they'll brush against each other, just like any other textile. And the more textile, the different pieces of textile that are in the mask, the more they'll brush which means the more microfibers are being released, therefore meaning we have an even bigger problem of microplastics. But we're not talking about that because everyone's just so busy talking about these masks being sustainable. Now, I'm working on a project right now where it uses um, mushrooms to actually mm. eat the blue masks. So basically I have a jar and that jar contains a fungus, coffee grounds, and my mask that's being cut up because the mask is made of cellulose. Again, that key word, cellulose. And what happens is the fungus eats the cellulose, it eats the, the coffee grounds as an extra source of um, food, and it creates mycelium. The mycelium then can be used to make leather and handbags and other things, but it's also a source of food. You know, it grows a mushroom, it fruits a mushroom. So we have ways that we can actually deal with these blue masks, but nobody wants to talk about it. And again, unless you're inside academia or you're working for some, you know, huge research company, Nova Nordisk or Novozymes, nobody wants to listen to you. And that's why I started Little Pink Maker because I had all these ideas, I had all these proof of concepts, I have all the scientific background to prove that this works, but nobody wants to listen to me because I don't hold a PhD. I don't hold a, you know, a doctorate. I am a textile designer. That's what my background is <laughs> through and through. I got into science as a way of trying to figure out, can I make new materials? And then my research was picked up by MIT and I was offered a fellowship. And even now, people don't think of me as this kind of scientific figure trying to save the world. People just see me as absolutely bonkers because I'm trying to do something different. That's the problem. People don't want to actually do the right thing. Everyone is so quick to try and make some quick green money Nobody actually wants to understand the real stuff that we can do to make everything more holistic and work better. Mm -hmm. That's um, an interesting aspect. And I wouldn't know that uh, coming from outside the industry, but um, talking about the materials in essence, I would actually be interested to hear your opinion uh, on why are we talking about alternative materials in the first place? Are the conventional materials bad or is there any environmental factors and uh, what, how would alternative materials change the fashion or textile landscape? So if we take, for example, um, alternative dyes. So when we talk about materials, we also have to think about the finishes of materials. So dyeing is a huge factor in the textile industry, which is so wrong. But what if I told you that inside of soil, there's at least seven different colors that you can dye your textiles with. So soil, I can dye your textile purple, pink, orange, yellow, and amazing shades of those colors from soil. And all it takes is some very simple science. So 
So um, different bacteria have different pigmentation and those pigmentation, if you extract off the Petri dishes and then you stick into incubators, it will actually permeate through the weaving of the textile and into the actual fiber itself and stain the textile. So what if we could eliminate completely all of the tanda, uh, rawhide tan dye that we have? What if we could eliminate you know, all these chemical processes for dyeing indigo? You know, no genes are made from traditional indigo anymore. I can tell you now, if you have a pair of genes that are indigo, hold a match next to them and tell me if you go on fire because indigo is naturally flame retardant. So if your genes are actually being made by a person who says they use true indigo, your genes will not go on fire. That's why warriors back in the, the um, Han Dynasty, they would wear indigo garments underneath their armor because it was flame retardant and also it had healing properties. So if they got injured, it would heal the wound quicker. And also they were known for throwing flame arrows. So it's kind of best of both worlds, protect yourself. But the problem we have is new materials, you know, plant-based materials, alternative dyes, they haven't been just a now thing. They've been around for millions of years. But the problem is that we've become so engrossed as 21st century humans to just think that what we have now is the only thing that we've ever had and we ever know. And it's like, no, stop. Look back at history. Look back at the Vikings. Look back at you know, what we used to have. How did we dye textiles with reindeer urine? How did we make it a process, you know, weaving and looming? We started by spinning fibers. How was that done with a stick and a stone? The processes we have, they may have been slow, but what we have now is far worse than anything we could possibly else create. We are at a stage now where what we create is so harmful that anything after this doesn't really matter because we need to start what we're doing now and think back to what we used to do the dyeing processes, the mechanical processes, the finishing processes, everything. And plant-based material or alternative materials play a huge role in that. I mean, we didn't used to have polyester. We didn't used to have visine. We didn't used to have nylon. You know, there's this talk of eucalyptus-based cellulose eco-glitter. Mm -hmm. Eco-glitter is not eco in any shape or form. It's just this talk again, to get more money out of you in a green sustainable highlight because greenwashing is everywhere. Whether you want to accept that or not, greenwashing is everywhere and how you fight it really matters. And by looking at you know textiles that are made from 100% cotton, you still have to ask yourself, how was it finished? Was it dipped in some kind of um, calcium you know, to make it whiter? Was it bleached in the process? You know, where's that bleach water gone? Is that going into rivers and streams that can you know, harm people further down the line? Just because you live in a Western country and your garment was made in an Eastern country, you don't care about what happens over there, but you should. Because if you are truly about sustainability, you're about sustainability for everyone, not just yourself. That's true. And how could um, a regular person know those uh, details? What would be your advice? I would say question. Question everything and everyone and it gets tiring and you will be told shut up so many times and you people will think you're crazy, like really crazy. <laughs> uh, the amount of times that I've emailed companies, Zara, H&M, um, Next, who else have I emailed recently? Evans, Topshop. I've, I've emailed all the big ones and I've asked them, you know, tell me where your water goes, you know, after you've dyed a garment. Responses are, we don't know. Tell me where all your scraps go when you're finished. Oh, well, they just usually get sent to another warehouse or we burn them or we just put them in the landfill. Okay. Tell me how much you pay your wages, you know, to the people making my textile. Oh, well, we try and support, you know, equality and we try and make sure that women have, you know, a home to live in. And if they have children, they go to school. Okay, so what kind of school do they go to? Oh, well, they go to this school and, you know, but they have to still pay for their books and their uniform and their meals. But does your wage pay for their books and their uniforms and their meals? You know, just because you give something to somebody doesn't mean that they can automatically afford it. It's a privilege to have an education. You know, it's a privilege to have a job. If you're privileged to have these things, 
then you really should think about what else goes on top of that privilege because it's not just going for an education or having a job. Your job might, might require a uniform. Your job might require a certain um, laptop. Your job might require a certain telephone. But if your wage doesn't pay that, then how are you on a, an equal measure? You know, it's there's a lot to it. And unless you really dig really nitty gritty and deep into sustainability, you'll forever be trapped in this circle of going around thinking you're doing the right holistic thing, but in reality, you're just contributing to greenwashing within society. I think you have touched upon and raised very crucial uh, questions that we don't usually ask ourselves. So yes, yeah, seeking for information and um, educating yourself, questioning uh, is crucial. And I would like to believe that also the more questions the companies get, the more pressure they will feel to also disclose this information or improve uh, the conditions. Uh, looking back into the alternative materials, I have this other uh, quite a burning question within me. <laughs> I was wondering to hear your answer on whether the textile industry as it is today, is it ready for alternative materials? Can um, a oh, yeah. shirt or um, let's say a garment made out of um, orange peels or the mushroom uh, material, can it come back to the system back again? Can it be recycled, um, upcycled? That's the beauty of all of this. So for example, there's a company um, that I know who uh, they're called Bolt Threads and they made this beautiful handbag. It's made out of reishi mushrooms and the thread is made out of reishi mushroom and they, um, they basically put this handbag on the market at an extortionate cost. And again, that comes back to, you know, do you have enough money to live this lifestyle? Shouldn't it be for everybody? So anyhow, they put this bag on the market and this bag is proven so once you have had the end of its life cycle, you do a special ceremony, basically. So you're giving thanks to the item that you've had, you know, for all the things it's carried, you know, for all the times it's got you around from A to B, which is really nice in essence, because you're also giving thanks to the fact that nature has given you this wondrous thing. So you do a ceremony. And the ceremony basically includes pouring on um, certain... Um, I wouldn't say chemicals, but they're more enzymes. They're natural agents found in nature to break down the product. So you pour on these things, you know, you put it into your compost heap. And then what happens is the compost uses the enzymes to start breaking it down. And it turns into new compost, complete new compost that you can then use for other things. So there's a complete circle and everything is... Um, it's as I'm going to say as natural as possible. And that's also the problem as we have as well is that a lot of the things that you see on the market, you know, we're told that we're doing biodegradable bio versus biocompostable. They're two completely different terms, but people don't know that. So as soon as you see a cotton t-shirt and your cotton says it is biodegradable. Okay, that's, that's great. That means my t-shirt will break down in a certain time frame. But everything should be biocompostable. If you want to be as sustainable as possible, biocompostable means it goes back into the soil. I mean, I can stick it outside in my garden here and it will completely degrade with no trace because the problem we have is biodegradable means that there's a microplastic or a microorganism left at 0.6 microns as defined by the EU um, UN sustainability guide. Biocompostable, completely biocompostable means that there's nothing. 0.0, .0 micron is found once the item is finished. So that's what we should be looking for. But again, you don't know that unless you do the science. And not everybody has the privilege to do the science or the knowledge or the time. And again, that's why I started a little pink as a kind of gateway entry for people to learn how to do that. That's true. And uh, there are also different terms of biodegradability and compostability, right? Because just yeah. because it says compostable, maybe it requires a uh, industrial composting system, which I wouldn't have as a, as a regular person. Ideally, if something is biocompostable, then it should be 
able to go into a household composting facility where you know it breaks down in your time not you know an industrial setting whereas biodegradable it needs to go into an industrial setting where they use specific enzymes and so on to break help break it down there's so many terms that we don't really use within sustainability and you know just because we see something as biodegradable we automatically think it's the best thing for us or you know we should buy this because it's doing the right thing when in fact it's not it's still going to sit there. It's still going to become a microplastic. Whether we want to acknowledge that or not, that's down to our individual personal morals. You know, everyone's idea of sustainability is completely different. There is no one right track to do sustainability, but you have to be on the track doing sustainability because if you don't do anything, you're part of the problem. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Would it also be far-fetched to say that um, producing from uh, food waste would also help food waste problems so one of the things that i work a lot with is um is milk um i mm-hmm. i'm not a big milk fan for many reasons I, I feel that the dairy industry has a lot of issues it needs to address um before you know i feel comfortable being with dairy um in a very close environment but working with dairy is an interesting thing because Again, we live in Copenhagen. Um, I'm my space is situated inside a school. We have a lot of waste milk-based products because the children have milk. And what happens if you take milk that is a waste-based item and you can turn it into plastic? Well, you can do that, and that's that's doable. That's what I do. So I turn milk into plastic, and basically I use a casein to make fibers. And the casein you can then spin and make a dress from milk. Milk. Now this has been done successfully in Germany numerous times by another company. Um, I'm not the only one doing this weird stuff around the world. There's many of us, and they basically have made garments from milk. So they call it milk silk because it's a protein. If you think of silk, silk is a protein. So you can do the same thing with milk. It's just a casein isolation. So again, even making this at home, it's really simple. Just grab some milk, grab some vinegar, which basically curdles milk. Make sure you have more vinegar than milk and then make sure your milk is lukewarm. Heat it up, pour in your vinegar, stir, 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 keep it on the heat and you'll start to see uh, basically it looks like cheese curds. And what you want to do is you want to grab those cheese curds and start putting it into a ball and you can actually shape it into things. So the first recorded milk um, item was 1986 and that was when somebody made a, a dice basically for a ball game. And that's how the majority of dices that we knew back in the um, the 80s and so on were first formulated was out of these milk. And then, of course, plastic came along and replaced what, everything we have. So um, there's many ways around it in general, but it can replace a lot of what we have in a sustainability sense. But there's a lot of work that we need to do. And also onboarding people, mm-hmm. asking people, hey, do you want to try this? Also changing people's mindsets around things is really, really tough because everyone loves plastic. Everyone, you know, uses plastic in some degree or variety every single day. But the problem we have is that we're told, you know, plastic is the enemy. Plastic isn't the enemy. It's how plastic is made that is the enemy. So Mm -hmm. we need to rethink that in essence. And it's really weird, you know, I'm, I'm talking to you on the sustainability podcast about plastic you know, I'm saying that plastic isn't the problem and it's a lot of people are going to sit there and go, oh, my God, she's so wrong. But if you actually look more deeper into it, it's actually the material it's made from, you know, a bioplastic. A bioplastic can be anything. This is the funny thing. The biocomposite side can be sugar, can be corn, can be rice. The plastic side can be many things, too. But just calling something plastic because of its mechanical properties, that's all it is. You know, plastic is made out of oil and oil comes from so many other sources in itself. But the reason why we call it plastic is because it's mechanical properties. So bioplastic, you know, why don't we call it biolooms or biohardness or bio whatever? We don't, we call it bioplastic because it's the property that gives. So it's not plastic that is a bad thing. It's how it's made that is a bad thing. I totally get it. And just... um... A quick question on the example that you gave about the dice. Um, then in such products um, production, we should make sure that it doesn't interact with other chemical or 
the process of doing that kind of stuff, it doesn't mean that it can't interact with other chemicals. It doesn't mean that you need a safe, secure environment to work in. It just means you need to be aware of biosafety. And biosafety is really important. So if you're working in the scientific realm, biosafety is just you know basic hygiene, for example, basic equipment, um, handling, making sure you know your glassware, for example, or mine, which is behind or in front of me. Um, I have you know clean, sterilized, prepped with silver foil caps, ready to go, so I know that what I'm doing is as safe as can possibly be. And um, the thing is, the bacteria I use, it's, it's classed as an E. coli bacteria, it's a gram-negative bacteria. So I'm working with E. coli, people automatically, they freak out. Oh my God, E. coli is not the thing that makes you sick. No, there's hundreds of different kinds of E. coli. This is just one form that yes, if you do something really, really wrong, when you sit down and you eat the textile while you're working, you'll probably get a bit sick. But I don't think anyone's stupid enough to do that. You know, I brief you before the class. I tell you the pros and cons and, you know, how to handle things safely. If you do that, then you're then you're stupid and you shouldn't be doing this and yeah. maybe rethink your life choices, you know? So it's really safe in essence. But also the thing that I love the most about this bacteria is that you can do so many amazing things with it. You can grow it really dense and compact and screen print with it, for example. You can make t-shirts that can grow. You can do the same with algal pigments. So I make a ton of algal pigments here in Copenhagen. So I go out to the beach. Um, I live on Amma. I go to the beach and I source algae that comes in from the, the tides. And then I process it. And I get the most amazing greens, yellows, sometimes even blues, depending upon what kind of algal it is. There's so many things that nature can give us, especially in, in dye relation. But the problem is not a lot of it is actually color fast. So you have to figure out how do I keep it color fast? How do I keep that vibrant color? And again, that comes down to finding methods and technology that can help you get that. And it's really easy. I mean, if you look at some of the natural things we have to do that, um, alum being you know a mineral stone is one. It gives vibrancy. It's also color fasting. Um, salt is another again that's a mineral we have so much that we can use but again it comes down to science and wanting to know how to use it and where to find it and so on that sounds like a lot of interesting research that you do and experimentation <laughs> and play um play, so I, play is pretty much it pretty yeah much it. and then you find out the solutions along the way i guess yeah, it's, it's interesting because I'm, like I said, I'm part of a, a global network at MIT of people doing amazing projects and amazing things across the world. And we share our resources, we share our ideas, and we try and make all of our work as open source as we possibly can. But the problem we have with the open source community is that also we have a lot of our work that's stolen and then companies that make huge money from our ideas. So we give out so much, but we don't give everything away because, you know, you will keep something a little bit back. You'll give them, you'll want, give them one more. Um, but yeah, basically we share our ideas. And I mean, there's amazing people in Peru right now working on turning quinoa into plastic carrier bags uh, or plastic based carrier bags, I should say. Uh, we have amazing things happening in LA right now with spirulina, people turning spirulina into textile dyes, different shades of blue and beyond. We've got people working in Indonesia turning uh, lotus silk basically into textiles. And there was actually a really good video um, from a person in Vietnam that I watched the other day. There's so many amazing things material wise happening across the world. But the problem is that we don't want to look outside our own box because, you know, we're comfortable here. We're surrounded by nice things. And, you know, it's it's easy just to go online and order the sustainable T-shirt, you know, or, you know, the H&M Conscious Collection because, oh, that's pretty. Look at the design. And, oh, the people must get a fair wage. When in reality, it's far from it. It's just another greenwash tactic. And as Black Friday rolls up very fast <laughs> it's also a huge problem in you know our consumerist lifestyle of do we need this do we actually need this or am I just buying this because I like the pattern or am I buying this because you know they've given me an extra 10 percent off when in reality they haven't they've hired the prices four weeks beforehand to make you think you're getting 10 percent off and then they drop it on the day to the price it was you know beforehand 
there's so many things that we just don't talk about and sustainability is is just one word but there's so many branches that can come off sustainability and we need to look at everything rather than just this one thing of you know how sustainable is my lifestyle you know how sustainable is my home how sustainable is my everyday way of living whereas sustainability means you know how sustainable is your mental health how sustainable is your relationship with people how sustainable is your you know space in a foreign country you know are you here on a visa is that sustainable long term how sustainable are you with your love relationship or your life and you know your relationship with money are you financially sustainable there's so much we don't talk about sustainability wise because we're so focused on let's save the turtles and how many reusable water bottles can i buy and that's the truth that's you know true. we're not focused on anything else besides trying to fix here and now which you know the, the planet's going to fix itself it's you know the science papers coming out that show that in some places you know for example if we take the australian bushfire the forest is regenerating itself that's what forests do they regenerate themselves so you know it's okay that part of it goes on fire it's okay if we have natural disasters happen because nature has an amazing way of coming back and being super kick-ass what we need yeah. to do is start thinking about the next 50 60 years and stop designing the crap that we have now and start planning for those next 50 60 years because ultimately that's what we need to look at Yes, that's true. And there is this concept that you briefly mentioned upon designing for disaster. Yeah. So um, I teach, I'm a guest lecturer at KBK, which is the Copenhagen Academy for Design and Arts. And um, I teach on the BA Ethics and Sustainability course. It's really interesting at times, I'm definitely going to say. Uh, but in short, basically, we have a concept that um, we made here a little pink, which is designing for disaster or designing the disaster. So designing for the disaster we are designing, you know, right here, right now, the things that we are having to use every day, whether it be a t-shirt, whether it be the latest VR system, you know, piece of jewelry, we're designing for now with what we have now. And we don't really care about anything else besides, oh, I used a piece of wood that came from a Gembrook station and now my thing is sustainable. Great, that's really great. I'm glad you did that. But where's that work going to go in 50 60 years time oh i don't know okay well then it's not really sustainable is it if you don't know the plan for this don't make you don't do it whereas designing for the disaster you're designing ready for those 50 60 years you're ready and saying okay i'm confident to know where my product is going in those 50 60 years i know where my piece of wood will go i know how it's going to be tracked and traced Maybe inside your ring, you know, that you've made out of wood, it has a barcode. And people, every time someone gets that ring, you know, they scan the barcode and they type their name in. And then you can see the previous owner and the owner before that and the owner before that, you know. Maybe then you can get in contact with the previous owners if the ring falls apart and it has a problem. Maybe they've repaired it in the past and they can teach you. There's so many things that we need to look at if we want to have the real, true, holistic lifestyle of everything being sustainable and everything working in harmony because what we have now just does not work it really doesn't and the sooner we wake up and we understand that the sooner we can develop and make a better concept i totally agree but uh, now i would then like to move towards the last um, part of our talk and uh, that would be five uh, questions uh, one by one, and I would like you to finish each sentence. Okay. All right. So the first statement is, to me, sustainability is? To me, sustainability is a better circular system that doesn't depend on a life cycle of objects, but rather a blue economy. Okay. A sophisticated one. Uh, the next one. One thing I would like to see more of in the world is? people making more and people doing more and people being better and learning the difference between upcycling and recycling because upcycling is broken we shouldn't upcycle mixing materials and calling it a brand new bag is not upcycling you're creating a bigger problem so um yeah basically people just having a better education about what they're doing being more hands-on and just in general ask more questions 
I think that's, yeah, that's, that's the big thing for me, ask more questions. Okay. For a complete beginner in the sustainability area, I would suggest to start off with? Oh, don't upcycle. Uh, <laughs> Don't upcycle. That's the one I definitely suggest you don't start to do. What you should do is, for example, um, so you're a beginner and you've got a broken pair of jeans. Most of us do have. You know, the legs are rubbery fast. Don't repair it with a t-shirt. Don't repair it with a jacket. Don't repair it with anything else but denim. And the reason I say this is because once you're finished with those jeans and they go into the recycling system, they go into a big conveyor belt, especially here at Vesper Branding big conveyor belt and the machine goes deep, 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 duh. So those deep, deeps are basically, yes, great material. And that dirt means, hang on, we've got a problem. And it basically, that material, because you've used a t-shirt and a, a piece of jean material, it knows that. So it automatically pushes it into a pile that is then sent to either be burnt or goes to landfill. So by you recycling and mixing your textiles together, it automatically creates a secondary problem. But there's you sat at home, you know, Vesterboro going, oh, I'm so happy I recycled, I saved the world today. But you've just made an even bigger problem because now that machine has to send your material to another space and place, which could cause harm to someone else. So okay. don't recycle. Okay, I see the drill now. Um of why you shouldn't uh, upcycle or if you do then you should be very mindful of what exactly you are using yeah if you if you, like upcycling is great don't get me wrong upcycling is great if it's done right there's so many people out there that do the wrong thing so what they basically do is they mix material together and they um they don't understand where it's going to go afterwards so if we think of circular economy for example too circular economy is broke because you get a table from Ikea and six weeks later you say, I don't want a table from Ikea, so uh, I'm going to give half to my sister. So you split the table in half, you keep half because it fits in better in the corner of your room and your sister has half. You've broken the product up into pieces, which means it doesn't have the mechanical properties or the strength it had anymore. So it's no longer really fit for purpose. Then you decide, oh, I don't like that white table anymore. I want it pink. So then you paint it pink. So you add a new material onto the material that no longer has the mechanical properties so it can't be structurally safe to do its job in the first place. But then you realize, hmm, I can make that table into a bookcase. So you make the table into a bookcase. It's no longer mechanically safe. It's in hundreds of tiny new pieces. It's painted pink with a different material on the top. And then you get bored of it really fast. And you say, oh, no, I don't like that anymore. I don't like this pink bookcase. I'm going to take it to the Genbrook. So you take it to the Genbrook, you pop it there for someone else. And then Sally comes along and Sally goes, oh, that's a nice pink bookcase, but it's too big. So now we've got a thousand tiny pieces. It's been cut into three pieces from the original table. It's no longer mechanically sound. It's got a different color on. It's just not right at all. And that system of recycling just doesn't work because if the property isn't mechanically sound, it shouldn't be used. You know, ultimately we're gonna have these other problems where everything that we have is gonna end up at landfill because we've hacked it to death, we've colored it to death. We no longer find it suitable for those needs that we want. And that machine at the recycling center goes, duh, because it can figure out where it needs to go. That's so true. that's the problem. That's the problem we have with upcycling. It's not being done right. If you are to upcycle, use the same materials. If you are to cut it in half, figure out, okay, if this table is no longer suitable to be a table, what else can it be? What else can I make it in that is mechanically and structurally right? That's how we should be doing it. Not, you know, cutting up 50 bed sheets and sewing them together and then dyeing them in different colours of olive green, you know, and I, I see it all the time and it frustrates me to the degree that I talk about it and people automatically presume like I'm a terrible person because I'm calling them out on social media for bad practice and I don't mean any harm I really don't but the thing is people get inspired by other people's creativity and that's great but I don't want people being inspired by doing it wrong and then creating more problems because the planet that we have now is ours 
And I want my nieces and nephews to enjoy the planet that we have. I want them to go to the beach and run naked, you know, like I used to as a child. I want them to go into the forest, you know, go picking for berries in the summer, like I used to as a child. I want them to have the same earth that we have now, but better. And we can't do that if people are inspiring each other with their creativity and doing things wrong. You only learn by being told. And I've made the most horrific things. I mean, some of my worst things I made, even now I look at and go, oh my God, that was a terrible idea. Why did I do that? But some of the stuff that I've also done terribly wrong have been my best mates. I've learned so much from doing them wrong. And you'll never know unless you do, but do it right if you can. That's my yes. advice. Do it right uh, with the means and knowledge you have right now. And then once you know better, do better. Exactly. And do better and also educate other people to mm -hmm. do better. If you see someone on Instagram making bags or soaps, you know, and maybe they claim that their soap is palm free, but they still use coconut oil, you're still using the palm. Come on, you know, stop trying to greenwash people. If That's you're making true. bags, you know, and you're claiming your bags are made from food waste and, you know, your bag is really sustainable. But then the whole practice behind, you know, you sewing the bag, where does your energy come from? Does it come from wind? Does it come from, you know, coal or gas? You mm -hmm. can't say something is sustainable unless you truly know its source. And if you do do that, then you're just greenwashing. It's, it's, that's it. That's it. That's it. Back to the questions. The fourth one uh, is uh, in within the same topic. So every sustainable business. Oh, Jesus. Every sustainable business needs a, a better business model than they think. It's a good one. <laughs> yeah, because that's the thing. When you think you know, your, your business is sustainable, as bringing enough income for you to you know, have a wage and to pay the people around you and to pay the space that you're in, yes, you're sustainable there. But ultimately, at some point, you know, you will burn out and that isn't sustainable. And, you know, then you start rethinking your business model of like, why have I burnt out? Am I doing too much? Am I making too much? And then you also have to question, as a business, are you consuming too much? Are you consuming too much time from other people? Are you consuming, you know, too much space of where you are? You know, do you need to downsize? Maybe you're in a beautiful, huge studio, you know, and you could afford it one month, but the next two months you can't afford it. Okay, then you have to downsize because you're consuming too much space. There's so many things that we should think about when we do sustainable business, but sustainable business is just more than, oh yeah, I want to save the world and all oh, of this piece of plastic I stuff in a recycling can today, yay go me. Because that's a lot of the problem that we have. And what you want your business to be is the zebra. So there's this concept of unicorns and zebras. Unicorns are great. They're startups that go out into the world and they're flashy and bright and vibrant. And look at me, I'm glamorous. That's great on paper, but in reality, people want zebras. They're black and white and visible, and you see them for miles around. You, everywhere you go, you see a zebra, and you go, that's that person, or that's that brand. And that's what ultimately you want to be as a business model. You want to be a zebra, because unicorns are mythical and magical, and you might be there one second, but the next you're not. You want to be a zebra. That's a good one. <laughs> that's a strong one. <laughs> Um, so then uh, talking about the long-term perspective, the last question would be, uh, in two to three years, I see textile industry. Oh God, that's a whole one. In two to three years, I see the textile industry. I would hope in two to three years, I see the textile industry at a stage where it actually promotes equality, whether it be gender balance, whether it be monetary value, whether it be, you know, actually empowering people to do better within the workforce. But also I'd like to see it being more plant-based. I'd like to see it producing garments that last longer. I'd like to see it being more kind of open and transparent. I'd like to see the companies actually really caring about what they make and do and holding to their core ethics and values rather than how much money can I make and how fast can I make 50 shirts? That's what I'd hope I'd like to see. Whether I see it is another thing. I mean, there's so many wrong things within the industry and people just don't know how to make things right. 
and where to start. And I'd say the place to start is by looking at, you know, the people around you, by making sure that the people around you are paid a fair and equal wage, ensuring that they're happy because their happiness ultimately will speak in that t-shirt. You know, they work better if, if they have food, they work better, if they slept better, they work better, if they know their family's secure, which ultimately means that that t-shirt is gonna look absolutely amazing because you know that they've had a better quality of life. And then because it's been so better, it means that more time has gone into it. You know, they've gone over the seams, one t-shirt by one t-shirt instead of mass cutting, you know, 50 t-shirts in one, sewing them on a huge machine, and then not even looking and checking to pull off the threads. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see that, but I, I really don't think that'll happen. And the only way for things to happen is for people, small scale people, you know, everyday person on the street, to start learning something and start taking matters into their own hands and start making their own fabrics and start asking questions about how can I sew? How can I embroider? How can I mend? How can I repair? And looking back at history, you know, World War II, prime example, you know, all the women who were in the flour mills, you know, supporting our soldiers, they use a the flower sacks to make dresses as an ends of means. And then people started to realize that these flower sacks were being made into dresses. So they started printing designs on the flower sacks. And that's why we have these beautiful 50s and 60s tea dresses with these beautiful patterns because thanks to the flower sacks and the women there who were there supporting and doing what they could. And that's what we need to do. We need to start supporting and doing what we can with what we find and what we make and what we do. That sounds very inspiring. So I hope that also <laughs> our listeners will find a lot of inspiration in our talk. And if they wanted to uh, find you, how can they do that? Uh, I am on all social media platforms. Um, so you can find me again at littlepinkmaker.com. Um, I'm on Instagram. Um, I'm on TikTok these days. Don't ask why. Um, haven't quite figured that platform out yet. But yeah, anyhow, I'm on TikTok, uh, Instagram, Facebook. Um, I do pre-corona that was I used to do talks and workshops across the world and yeah basically I also do community craft drop-in sessions here in Copenhagen where people can just come in have a coffee you know ask questions about you know where did this product come from can you help me track and trace it can you help me send an email to companies how do I word things correctly um, you know and also crafting too at the same time so uh, yeah that's how you can find me if you want to know more and um, I'm always open to questions or even if you want to have a dialogue with me maybe you think what I've said is completely wrong and you want to challenge me on that let's go let's have a dialogue about how we can do better because it's only by having a dialogue that we can do better otherwise we never know.